meeting to order. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Ginzer? Here. Mr. Mulholland? Here. Mr. Harrelly? Dr. Greenlee? Here. Ms. Steinman? Here. Mr. Huber? Here. Ms. Hanneman? Ms. Kiske? Here. Uh, audience and visitors, we don't have anything that should be. But to know if there's any way you can make the net levy amount either be flat or maybe raise the one percent after you do the uh, abatements. Kind of like what he did a couple years ago, which I think went down. I didn't have Boone's official estimate EAB. I had I got it today. Um, so it's kind of some information I got from Mr. Mratz and just kind of going through this. So these are still very um, loose numbers, very draft numbers, but um, just kind of a general idea and some kind of guidance from everybody. Um, so here's our levy timeline today. Obviously we're meeting just for a uh, draft presentation. Um, November 12th, uh, school board meeting will to the tax levy presentation and then December 17th um, is when the public hearing is on the tax levy and then we'll also adopt the levy. My one question for you guys is, do you want it to go to the October board meeting as well? Because um, we have an October board meeting in there, or well, November, I can do it either way. So um, I guess at the end we can really discuss where we want it to go next. So, but there is an option to present it twice to the board before they have to take a vote. Budget we did it in July, mm -hmm. then again in August, vote on in September. <laughs> Um, so revenue to the school district, I know you guys heard this, but we have local, which is the property taxes, uh, which is generated through this process. Our state, which is the evidence-based funding, we're considered a tier one. Um, so this year we've got an additional about 434,000 um, from that. And then federal grants, which are special ed, Medicaid, ELL, all of that. Uh, this is just kind of a, a new graph that I put in here, but this is per student revenue by source, and it's by percentage. The blue is the property taxes, so you can kind of see each year how much of our revenue is made up by property taxes, um, by other, the orange is other local revenue, the red is at the evidence-based funding, um, and as you can see over time, our evidence-based funding is beginning to take a bigger chunk of our revenue, which is what we'd like to see, as opposed to the, the blue, um, and then we've got the federal sources on the top there. Uh, these are our fund balances. Um, we talk, this was the audited at the end of the FY19 fund balances. So there's one for each of our um, each of our areas there. And this is another, just a quick snapshot. The light blue at the bottom is our fund balance over the years, so collectively as a district over the years. And you'll see the spike in 2015. That's when we got the um, capital development bond money there. So in all of our <laughs> reports and stuff, that 2015 year is just kind of off because of that 13 million or 12 million that came in. Um, the orange line is expenditures by fund, and the green line is revenue by fund. And so you can see that like the last three years, um, our expenditures have been below our revenue for, for those years. And it kind of, and that's kind of where you want it to be. You kind of want it to run in tandem together. <clears throat> so why are we here? Tax levy. Um, this is the amount of taxes that we're going to impose by the school district to our community. And so um, and it does account for a large portion of our revenue for our district. Um, and every year our tax levies do the last Tuesday in December, so we've got to make sure we get that in. Our EAB, our Equalized Assessed Value, um, this is not known when the levy is adopted. Um, we kind of make some estimates. The counties will come out and tell us this is what we think we're thinking is going to happen. Um, we have a rate setting EAV, which is up there from the year before, saying this is what happened. This is what we think may happen for next year. So we use those numbers to kind of determine um, what the levy may be this coming year. A few changes on here. Um, 
the estimated EAV, including the construction, I have about 168 million. I anticipate that may go down a little bit to around 165-ish uh, with the new numbers that came in from Boone. Um, estimated new construction, Boone's saying it's over, it's like 1,400,000. Um, so new construction looks like it potentially may have gone up this year, so I wanna make sure that I will adjust that to capitalize that new construction. Um, so you can kind of see the estimated change. I was hearing about 6%, uh, but with that new construction, that's bumped it up a little bit to about 8% change from last year. Another big change this year is our consumer price index, the CPI. Uh, this is typically a factor that raises, so typically we raise our levy by CPI. Last year was 2.1%, this year it's 1.9. So our, the CPI did go down, which means the district potentially could get less money um, because of the CPI, but that, that did go down this year. Uh, just a little information on tax levy or tax rate, if you guys want to have any more information on that. Um, they do have a formula to figure out how will they figure out tax rate. Um, usually we use the fair value of a, of a home and kind of figure it that way. Um, and one thing about the EAV and the tax rates, when the EAV goes up, which is done last year and this year, tax rates naturally go down. But what happens in the communities is, is when an EAV goes up, that means that you're your house may be worth more. So even though your tax rate's going down, you're, you're multiplying it by your house, which may be more. Um, so it's kind of one of those things, but when the EAVs go down, your tax rates go up, so now you're taking your multiplier by maybe less. So it's kind of this balancing act of, we may lower our tax rate, but you may have community members saying, but I'm still paying more taxes. That's because their house is now worth more than it was before. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through. So after the levy is done, we'll take it to the community. Um, to the county clerks. This is just the last couple years extensions that we've done. Um, we are a cap district, um, and then we have our bond extension, um, and those are the total for 17 and 18. Um, and then the abatement of bonds. So here's another um, an area that we've, the district has an already set um, abatement schedule with Baird with our bonds. Um, 17, we did 700,000 as part of that plan, but then we, abated an additional 235,000. So what we were, we've been doing the last two years is we've been abating essentially CPI. So we, we levy the CPI from the taxpayers and then we turn around and give it back to them on the bond payment. This year we're planned to abate 1.1 million. Um, that's part of the schedule re restructure plan. Um, and then we'll get into the conversation of if we do want to abate it this year or where we kind of want to abate that. The property tax relief grant, we did apply for this last year, we did not get it. We, um, it's obviously a conversation to have if we want to apply for it again. It's part of the evidence-based funding model. Um, they have a certain pot of money that they're giving to school districts based on need for to help um, abate taxes, or abate some of the taxes for the community. So um, once this comes out, um, it'll be due in January, I'll provide more information to the board as, as we get it. But that will be an option to, um, unfortunately we have to, Usually about last year, by the time we um, accepted the levy, they hadn't decided who was going to get that abatement money, and I'm guessing that'll probably be the same again this year, but it's an option that we can look at. Okay, so we, I have three options for just kind of discussion. Um, kind of the same as last year, option one is to levy CPI, which is the 1.9%, which we typically do. Um, a level a levy any additional money for the increase in the EAV and new construction. So I do we do typically typically put on a kind of a padding there to say if it's more than what we estimate we can capture it. Um, typically our levies we levy more and then we get less, um, but we don't want to leave money on the table there. Abate bonds which have been previously agreed upon, which is that 1.1 million. Um, estimated levy rate would be about 6.9 percent. Last year we were about a 7.4 ish. Um, so it would go down. Um, potential decrease of a home would be about $231. Now this is if my $150,000 home stays $150,000, right? <laughs> potentially it's not going to. Um, but if it did, if you lay flat in your house, you could potentially save about $200. Um, the option two would be to levy that CPI again. Oh, and I apologize, it says 2.1, I'll fix that. It should be one point nine. Um, levy any additional money for the EAV and new construction, abate the bonds, um, which we previously agreed upon at about 1.1 million, and then to abate the CPI percentage, which at 1.9% is about 175,000. So we would ask 
the taxpayers for that, and then we would give it back to them. Um, and then the rate there would be about 6.8 or 7%. Um, <clears throat> and then the last option is not to levy that CPI increase. So the district could, would lose about $175,000 in revenue. Um, so it would be about $278 for one of those $150,000 homes. Um, the tax rate's about the same at 6.8473. So it's only slightly different than if we were to evade it, or if we were gonna capture the CPI and evade it back. So a couple options, not a huge difference in the tax rates, but for depending on how much a person's home went up, it could potentially have um, an impact there as well. Questions, what else information do you guys wanna see? I think one of the things that I had looked at in the past, and that was when the evidence-based funding came in, the, the concept, and I think last year the school buses came up, yeah. but it was the idea that if that money comes in and it's kind of a bonus amount, that our, my inclination would be is that we would use that to further evade taxes unless administration came up with something that they felt was a, a need that we had. <clears throat> and I think we talked at that time last year that we felt the buses and getting rid of some of that old fleet was, would be a reason to not do it. And so I guess I, I would like that similar type of thing to this year, because that amount is more this year. Is it the same? Are you expecting the same for EVF or is, that, is uh, it actually? Yeah, about the same for EVF. Um, okay. The amount this year is a, that we would abate because of CPI is slightly less because it's at 1.9%, not 2.1. So last year I think we abated an additional 200,000. This year would be about 175 if you abated CPI. Um, but EBF is about the same as it was last year. So. That's where I was at too. I was thinking it's exactly the same thing. I'd be interested to see what that, how that lines up for us going forward next year. Mm -hmm. If there's something that we could potentially do with that money. Mm -hmm. I can look into that, and I know after coming out of facilities, and we'll be talking about bus transportation here later, some of this might, but I would not talk to administration. I, I agree to that. If you know, you take the CPI, either um, use it for abatement or a worthwhile big project like replacing buses and, and our aging bus fleet. Um, you know, if there's something like that to earmark that money towards. I, I don't want to look to levy the CPI and then just throw it into the general fund to be spent on. Who knows what? Do you have a feel? Um, I know a lot of this, like you're saying right now, you're some things the county is guessing and everyone's not trying to mislead anybody but you're just making the best guesses right. that you can make i felt when we got to december of last year our intention was is that we were trying to hold things flat that our best guess we were trying to fund the buses but we were trying to hold things flat and then the state came around with equalizing and things like that and i felt as a taxpayer that didn't we didn't accomplish what we were trying to do and that is to hold things flat it seemed like there were pretty high percentage increases and uh, judging from our like the farmland assessment this year it looks like it would be in case and so I guess I still struggle that we make these calculations we try to hold things to minimize the impact and not affect administration with what you're able to do but we're still hitting our taxpayers out here and I'm not sure what what the magic calculation is to try to, to hit that, but that's what my concern is, is that we sit here and we, we're making a best guess. And- um, Trying to be conscientious. Conscientious, and it still seems like we're maybe being too conservative in what we're doing, or we're at least based on this last year because of what the, I don't know. I, I, it's just my, my feeling is that we're not, quite accomplishing or what we're trying to do but um, I think the hard thing and I guess 
is that I can say that our levy is potentially as flat as we can make it, right? We're not going to levy CPI. We may get some new construction or the EAB may go up a little bit, but I can't say to an individual taxpayer, your bill is going to be flat because I don't know what your house is valued at. And I, you know, so I, if your house goes up 20%, I, I, you know what I mean? Like, we, I can't. Yeah, begin to guess even you know, what that would do for individual taxpayers. And that's, I guess, where I was going on my assessment that I just had. Yeah. Um, as near as I can tell, like it seemed like the home values were the same, but it looked like the farmland was going up. It looked anywhere up to like six, six and a half percent. And that's the part. So, if a farmer is setting out there, is he gonna even if we go flat, are they gonna see? There's the same thing. Six and a half farmlands based they don't on the really productivity do. tables. It's done by the Illinois the University of Illinois presents a five year running average of income that farmers make. Now this year because of the rain, they're not gonna make that income. That five year average isn't gonna be figured in until next year and it'll probably still be up. But this year it's typically up anywhere from like six to even some as high as fourteen percent. But then now you're talking about across the entire state though. That average, right? Right, right. Yeah. right. If you have the same soil, so here our weather average, here is. If you have the same soil and productivity value here as in McLean County, it's, right, it's the same. Yeah. So yeah, our class A soils here in McLean County really kick our butts because you just go across, you just go east here a little bit in McHenry, and they don't have those same, same kind of soils. So um, that's you know, it's a double whammy. Taxes are starting to catch up with their pain in the counties. It's a double edged sword. And I get the dilemma the is how do you how do you take care of both homeowners and large farm entities all at the same time? There's, there's no way in within the formula that, that's to accomplish both of those deals of, of assessments and assessment. Yeah. Back to your point is so. I was giving you numbers. I'm just assessor for Boone Township. Right, right. Okay. But within North Boone, there's Manchester, Leroy, Poplar Grove, I think even parts of Caledonia, right? And so Kathy has those. And I don't know. And then when she's doing it, there's a section in North Boone and a section that's in Belvedere School District. So. And did they give you numbers for just North Boone? Um, I talked to um, Mr. Newport, and he sent the. Um, the estimated EAV for Boone County, and then I've got estimated EAV for Winnebago County too with new construction. So I've got for both the North Boone share of it. Yes, yeah. Because that would come off the abstract. Abstract that should be pretty close. Yeah. So um, I know from what this presentation is, I know the new construction has gone up about five hundred thousand. Um, their estimate, um, but yeah. So I do have both of those now. But. So so if a house was here, here here's kind of a simplistic way to look at it, but if a house went up 20% and the North Boone average went up 8%, if you guys do a flat levy, that person's still going to have the difference between 20 and 8%. They're going to go up probably 12% their tax bill. And so like the farmers that have 10% on their productivity table, if the average is going up 8, you guys do flat, their bill's still going to go up Two or three percent. There's pockets that have gone up more than others. Right, so yeah, and Candlewick and the Cape and Subdivision both went up like more than 10 percent. So. so we can do our part and say, like, we're, on all three options, we've lowered our tax rate from last year. Last year was about 7.4, and our highest tax rate here is 6.9. So even if we abated, or even if we took all that we could and, did, and just abated what we planned, where our tax rate is still lower, and but you wouldn't see that if unless your house stayed flat, I guess. That's kind of a, yeah, yeah. Right, because people don't look at the rate. Right. Dollars. Yeah. Right. 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 So what was the total figure last year? You've got three options here. What are we comparing to for the total? Um, which, what do you mean? Hmm. Where you have total off funds. For each of the three? Yeah, you have a total off funds for each of the three options, but what, what are we comparing with for last year's total? Um, last year's total was. Yeah, I think you had it on a screen. Yeah, we did. But I was you hold up. So last year so was 9.2. Um, 
for the total capped. So we're about 50,000 um, over that. Um, there it is. Is that right what there. you're looking yep. at there? Okay. Our bond. The total with extension was 11,579. 11, so actually it's a little bit less because of the bonds, the bond abatement. Okay. So all three options are a little less than last year. Yeah. The net amount. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you guys need to know? Jake, Mary, any? Do you want to see it in October, November, and vote in December, or just November, December? Do you want us to bring it in October and just for the whole board to at least discuss? I think I would. I think okay. I, I think it'd, it'd be in formative for the board to at least digest it first okay. and before they were supposed to just see it vote on yeah, it. And absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and then put it on display. At least now they get some input before it goes to display. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the next item is the employee assistance program. Yes, yeah, so this is kind of um, more of just a discussion piece and, and some guidance on where we want to go with this. Um, the Employee Assistance Program, we've been asked a few times um, by employees and other people, do we have an EAP, an Employee Assistance Program? And essentially, it's a wellness and productivity piece of a benefit that we can give employees. Um, so their employees and their family members could um, contact this company with issues related to behavioral, emotional health, family, legal, financial, wellness, 24-7. Um, so essentially, they could call or email and say, I'm having a problem, can you help me? Um, and then they take the, they intake it, and then they can help people find resources or refer them to a doctor um, or something like that. So it's just a way for our staff to kind of focus on that social emotional piece that we're talking about for students too, but something for our staff in case they're having um, difficulty or need outside assistance. Kind of some reasons why um, this is actually coming um, as our we asked through our health insurance, and so that's where we got this information from. So um, as you know, sometimes when you face problems, it can impact workplace and performance, um, helping reduce stress. It could have a, an impact on our medical insurance if we can get staff assistance with her, that kind of a thing. Um, this is our current proposal. This will cover all staff. This proposal is for all staff with insurance. I reached back out to the company and they said it's intended for all staff. So whether they have insurance or not, it would be for all staff. Um, it's three sessions for about 2,600 or five sessions for about 3,000. So it might go up a little bit if once we include the people that don't have insurance, but I'm guessing it would be on about 3,500 is my guess for the year. Um, it would be no cost to employees. They could have three or five sessions, call in or whatever they needed um, to get help for, for that year. And that's our district cost? Yes, the district cost. Um, the district would get an, an end of the year like utilization report on Here's what people use. So if we get it back and nobody's used it all year, then obviously this is not worthwhile over time. Um, we don't get any information. So I don't know. Nobody knows that I maybe called about, you know, my four-year-old. But, you know, <laughs> you know so you, you, would, you would know what people are calling out. We would just know that it was being used. So I just wanted to bring this to you just because we've had some, some staff, major staff issues over the last couple of years. But people have asked, and it was just one of those benefits that I thought that at least discuss something we wanted to look at. So go deeper into Mike's question. Yeah. So is it, is it $2,699 per employee that would be our cost? For all employees from here. And then that would entitle them any and all up to three sessions mm -hmm. of assistance, some sort of support. Mm -hmm. Can you go that covers every employee? That's what I asked. I was like, ooh. So this has come up at our superintendent's <laughs> meetings as we're running shorter on staff, our pools are lower, we don't have the personnel to come from. And we do have personnel that are walking in with issues and emotional issues that they need to be helped on and sorted out. And so uh, kind of from the superintendent side we were talking about, with what some of our people are starting to deal with by having some of this stuff, does that help us um, support them better? create a better atmosphere for them in which to work, give them the supports they need, hopefully a little less time off, because uh, they've got the supports they need, you know, creating that productive atmosphere uh, for an employee. So that's, we, and we've talked just because pools are smaller, times have changed, almost at a social, social emotional piece for, for staffs too. Um, 
at our Illinois State Conference, one of the largest things that they kept talking about was social emotional needs at schools right now. And um, uh, there was a professor that came and spoke to us from Harvard University. And a lot of their research and stuff is focusing on, it's great that you're gonna put those in for kids. It's important you better have some of that stuff for staff too. Because if the staff, uh, that staff with the right mindset is gonna make a bigger difference on kids is what our research is showing. So, um, we talked about this employee assistance program. The speaker from Harvard really kind of opened my eyes just on kind of laying some of that foundational stuff towards um, hopefully retaining staff, improving instruction, having a larger impact towards reach towards kids. And um, he was a, he worked on studies of um, emotional health and productivity in the workplace. That was what he worked on at Harvard. Uh, his dad was a neuroscientist down in Baylor that um, studied this, the productivity of the research. Interesting stuff, it really was. And so there's no other, it's not open up and we're, there would be more, pet, more cost if somebody needed more than five sessions passed on to the district? No, the district could choose whether they get three or five. After that, if they get six sessions, it would be on them or on their health insurance. So, you know, if I needed to talk to a lawyer, they could refer me to a lawyer, maybe at a discount or just maybe they could give me legal advice. But you know that would be free of charge. But if I go over, then that I have to pay for it. But they're just referring you to some place. It's not like they're giving you. Well, they have people on staff, so they've got you know support. social workers on staff, and they've got behavior people. On, I mean, they have people on staff that can help with some easier questions, and then they refer for some other questions. So it's not just emotional; it's legal, it's wellness. Like, hey, what kind of diet should I eat? They can help. You know, it's just stuff like that where sometimes staff will go to. You know each other you know and so i think it's just another resource that they could utilize professional for lack of a better term is that you have to do this works just for you to be in the network for lack of a better term their network you can't you couldn't go to your own doctor your own mental health your own social worker and have these guys cover no you have You're, to go you through that. deal directly yeah. with them yeah. with their network yeah. now, now i got my head around it yeah and it's gallagher is I don't, Gallagher doesn't own it, but Gallagher works with them to give us the quote. So we had Jake had said, would this work with our insurance? Yeah, they would know where to route us if that was part of our insurance. Glenn, did you have a question? I was just wondering for, for that cheap rate, is it all just phone service? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of it is phone service. Um, but, but that's Somebody in, did. that's in, the way I read it, it was unlimited phone service. But um, I, I thought this was a, I thought this was an in per, this was a in they person. do do some in person oh, stuff they yeah. do um, well, it well, really kind of depends so. on what your uh, what your needs are it local in person EAP assessment referral counseling and brief treatment up to five sessions depending on the model chosen mm -hmm. this my employer has almost this I don't think they do the financial piece uh -huh. this was kind of a new it's more the counseling piece is what they offer, but um, it's very close to what they have. The, I guess the only thing when I was looking at the last page, they mentioned about this being a, a five-year guaranteed contract. Mm -hmm. So would you have to commit, that would be my question, would you have to commit to five years? Okay. And then the, yeah, so prices are pretty low. Um, I guess the other part I would want to know is to follow up with Glenn and, and that are asking is, is this an in-person, like is it, are they contracted out with Rose Grants or someplace locally yeah. for the three to five and then um, after that, then, you know, like you said, you'd be on your own. Do you want me to bring this back to October with more information? Yeah. I guess one other thing is, and this gets into the, if you were to open this, to all employees so I'm assuming if you're getting a North Moon check you would be eligible for it yeah. um, is this something that with um, the our union contracts that you could offer it and then withdraw it like in two years or would it be a perceived benefit that you couldn't take away from them later or would it would it have to be negotiated or something that's the part well we talked about it through the health, uh, life or the insurance committee and that's kind of where it originated initially. And the way I kind of stare at that is, is we use that committee to kind of drive our decisions, but I think that these are 
board decisions. So it's not something that can become negotiated down the unless, unless we opened it up during the negotiation and put that as a piece in the contract. Because the board kind of oversees the health plan. Well, I understand that, but there's some things once you provide it, you cannot withdraw, can you? Or you would have to negotiate the We withdrawal. have like the supplemental su supplemental accident insurance too, and that's not in any of the contracts either. Okay. It's just the I, health insurance that okay. is in I have both not stared contracts at it. and both of those are kind of identical. Okay. Okay. I can get a clarification on that though, Tom, just to make sure that there's not some legal ramification on the back side. The if the board chooses not to do it. When you have a side letter, yeah. that's something Let me do that. that I'll provide it for all. You know, it, I mean, yeah, you have yeah, to say, that, hey, yeah, I want this I want for the optional one. That's not the case here, right. which would make a little bit of a difference. Well, I guess the other thing, I get the other question I want to make sure is that in that contract, I didn't see that there was a five-year contract, that there's not the potential for some escalator clause in it to change the, co the cost of it over the course of the year. You know, wow, you guys are using, you know, a item high. <laughs> Right. Five since that we can we can run the price of this up fifty percent now and you still you can't get out of your contracts. So. Yeah, <clears throat> so was this pricing because the paperwork was from last December? Yeah, no, I is checked it and he said the pricing is still pricing the same. Yeah. It will go up from the, the slide that I presented just because I had only quoted our insured staff, so I'll run it again with our entire staff. I can see staff using it as the social and emotional needs of the students go up. So in turn, does the social and emotional of a lot of the teaching staff and the teachers and everybody that's included. And this is for the entire whether you have insurance or not insurance, it's that person and their family. Yeah. It's the way that I really look at it. It was welcome when we discussed it. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll bring it back to the next month's meeting? Not the board meeting, but the next business meeting? Or will be business or do you want to go board? I don't see why we shouldn't introduce it to the board and see if somebody else sees this as something that there's more that we need. Maybe just send it as information on the first time. Okay. But those are the clarification. Yeah, but the clarification. Okay. okay. So run that as a new business item and just information on our work, just to make sure that we bring it back in November. Just engage the reaction of the group. Okay. Good luck. Okay. Buses. Buses. Okay, so transportation purchases just kind of yeah. <laughs> she loves her PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so history, a little history. You guys know this, but a little history. Last year we purchased 10 international buses. Thank you. The drivers are very appreciative. Um, we had 400 buses that came around November, December, I believe, time frame, somewhere in the mid year. Actually, maybe even later than that. And then we had six air brake buses that came in August. So we have all 10 buses now. So our current fleet, we have 29 buses, we have 19 in daily rotation. Um, we have four vans, a Yukon, two trucks, and a white bus. So our long-range plan last year, we kind of decided we would do, we purchased 10 buses for three years, and then we'd move to a bus rotation of replacing five to six buses every year. Um, remember that, that um, kind of a five-year cycle where that's when you're getting reimbursement from the state for those five years, and then we, so we were always getting reimbursement on our buses. We kind of have an opportunity here as um, we kind of sat down and started looking at our buses. Um, with newer buses and fewer routes, our need for the spare buses has decreased. So right now we have 19 buses in rotation. We have 29 buses in our fleet. Um, and so some days we have you know, nine or 10 buses sitting in our lot um, that 
that are not being used. Now, preface that with, we also, we need spares, right? We need spares. And sometimes we have routes running where people are taking field trips and we have subs in. And so it's not every day they're sitting, but it's potentially that they, they could be. So um, kind of thinking about that, we have some, um, some flexibility of maybe trading some buses in and not purchasing some buses. So maybe decreasing our fleet a little bit, um, which could help with, with other projects and kind of things that we're going. So for 1920 for this year, um, this is just basic framework from all kind of the research we've done last year. Um, I'm thinking potentially still the international buses. Um, air brakes as available. We do have some hydraulic buses, but I think the drivers appreciate the air brake buses. Um, 77 passenger when possible, uh, with the exception of if we're getting military buses, um, and then we're purchasing the buses. I think the leasing option was going to serve our needs as well as the purchasing was. Um, then for this year, we're thinking. I'm thinking about trading in the 10 buses, um, purchasing five special need wheelchair buses. Our special need buses are um, are the ones that are causing us some uh, expense now with repair and breaking down. So it's definitely those buses that are um, purchased. Two buses with an undercarriage. So these are our sports buses. Um, purchase two just regular buses, school buses, and then possibly another white bus in addition to the one we have. We use these a lot in the summer. We use these for um, sports trips, like smaller sports teams, some of that kind of thing. Um, our potential budget would be about $725,000 um, for, for those 10 buses. Next, so not this year, next year, 2021, um, trade in six buses. Um, purchase one with the undercarriage and then three regular buses. So essentially we wouldn't be, we would be trading in six, but we'd only be purchasing three. Um, and then potentially looking at the district van or the new capitals are both kind of up there in miles. Um, and so our budget would go back down to 375,000. So this year we've already budgeted for that large bus person purchase of 725,000, but next year I'm thinking um, that we could definitely scale back and still still get to our goal of having a, a new fleet, um, just not buying as many buses, just because we, we don't have any for them um, like we did. 2021-22, uh, um, we would trade in the three remaining buses, we purchase three buses, possibly look at the van, if not, so potential budget around 300,000. Um, and then 22-23, then we would start our five-year rotation where we're trading in five, five or six buses um, every year and a potential budget around four just kind of a reminder, we get about $11,000 a year for five years for every bus when we, when we get it. So once it hits our lot for five years, we get about $11,000 reimbursement back from the state. Um, so when you're talking about 10 new buses a year, that's um, you know, about $100,000 we're, we're getting um, we're getting back from the state. And then once we start, once our bus and we start this rotation, then we just have that income hopefully to help fund most of our bus purchases. So um, that's kind of where we're going. So kind of the next steps from is obtaining quotes October, November. Um, Midwest did reach out to me and said, what, what does it look like? What are you guys thinking about? So they're starting to get their lease lists in of what's gonna be available in the summer. It's, we're kind of looking for us from what direction are they looking for. Um, November board meeting, um, I'm hoping to have some bus purchases and quotes to you guys is my hope. Um, and then our buses will be delivered this summer of 2020. Any questions or any ideas or thoughts or any comments? What I can discern <clears throat> when I was here about using the, the white bus was the, the potential liability that it posed to the employees that used it. There were a lot of loopholes in the law, which, say for instance, Cindy's got the FFA kids someplace and she does something that she shouldn't have pull up in front of somebody, does whatever. That, those employees had a lot higher level of um, liability that they were exposed to individually than employees did, as bus drivers did. So do, or do we have those conversations with the people who are taking the, the white bus out to say essentially you're doing it, there's there's some risk to you, open risk to you to drive this piece of equipment? You know, and I can look into what, what information is given to staff when they, I don't have the I was going to say, when we talked about liability with Joe, have we heard that from Joe? No, we've not heard that from our... Because that's the first time here, right? And I don't look like to go back to my liability here. I mean, I, 
and say, is that true? We were just getting into the whole yeah. bus thing when I was in my time here. Yeah. I guess that's where my question is, is it has to have the rules changed. I certainly see more white buses on the road, you know, or, or, or is there a way that we could potentially supplement, um, put some kind of supplemental policy on them for their time in there to cover them? Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of training and stuff that they get to use them? I know that yes, yeah. you know one of the big things we always say is, well, you don't need a CDL to drive this. Well, it's still not a car. No. It's, still not a, it's still not a minivan. You know, um, do we understand what it means? To There's an anxiety that comes with it too. What does it mean to take 15 other people's kids down the road at 65 miles an hour? You know, and when should you be on the road? When shouldn't you be on the road? You know, those kinds of things. So, I, for me, it's just cautionary. I understand the white bus makes it really convenient for. Advisors and coaches to take small groups of kids. You know, to get that, I just mm -hmm. just want to be sure that somebody doesn't get burned in the deal at some point. Understand? You know? Yeah, and I'll check into that before we go forward and I have a question. I'll check with the state too to make sure that we're in compliance with that. Yeah, I, I haven't. I don't discuss it with with the drivers on things. It, it, we will if somebody feels uncomfortable. We'll try to find some other alternative means because I know we've worked with the cheerleaders before to say, okay. You know, I'm not comfortable. Yeah. yeah. So that's the piece we get a lot is some people just not comfortable driving that side of the road with people in it. Which I get. I never wanted to drive it. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. We had terrible experiences with the chess program. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up. So. <laughs> I didn't think of the liability side. I did think of the anxiety because we do get a lot of people that come forward with the anxiety that like that's I'm not comfortable. You know? But we're getting that. Uh, we may get that other program. So afterwards, they can call. We've got a counselor. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, just forget I said anything. So. I mean, you feel bad for somebody in his situation. The weather was clear when they left, but man, it was certainly it wasn't clear when they came back. Yeah, yeah. that's when Jeff was driving. He mm -hmm. sights like a semi. Yeah. And we did a lot of that last year. So watching icy conditions. I mean, that kind of happens ice. to me too. You leave home and it's fine, and you yeah. leave wherever you're at, and you're like, I so oh. wish I never left my house. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I saw in the in the trade thing, listen, I, I, I didn't catch it. I wasn't following you. I was looking at my numbers yeah. here. You're getting rid of 200 carriages. Are you replacing 200 carriages this year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and with that, the sheet that you have there, my. My inkling is, after looking at some of the sheets, is that the special ed buses, depending on the size, may be less than the 80,000, um, where the undercarriages buses may be more than the 80,000. So it'll depend on what those come in. So I figured this year, lumping in the five special ed buses with the two undercarriage buses may help offset their costs together um, there, so. And they'll all come, come uh, equipped with us bars. I will check into that. Check and check that's one of those things, um, if you go back a few slides, Kelly, um, Maybe just one. Uh, right there, that one. This one? Oh, one more. Down. One more down. Sorry. <laughs> um, that's, that, that's kind of my list of, is there anything that you want me to make sure that I'm a quote when we get them? Um, just so it's complete, because I think last year when we started down this yes. process, the S bars weren't part of the yes. original quote. And we had to go back and get them. So, I mean, I guess the as far as the camera systems, you know, getting mm -hmm. them all moved, you know, all that stuff mm -hmm. should be part of it. Are we okay with the international and the air brakes? I mean, is, okay, or do you so wanna, we're good there. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Because last year we also talked about not ju not just limiting it to internationals. Let's reach out for other ports, mm -hmm. too. A lot of times that's where it falls, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, at least be aggressive with the quotes. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. okay. Uh, the one thing that I have heard from drivers, mm -hmm is some of those buses we got this year did not come with the air seats. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'd be interested to see, now that they've used them for a little while, if they hate the, the seats now, mm -hmm. and whether air seats become, I don't know what kind of expense or cost that is, but yeah. everybody's thankful for the new buses, but that was the one little thing that I heard is, oh, I don't have an air seat. Do you, have, do you have air seats on hydraulic brakes? It's a very small compressor that sits underneath, that's actually a box that sits underneath the seat, so it doesn't take that much to, to be honest, if it was that big a deal, I'm sure you could spend the summer adding the kids to it. Adding kids. Yeah, I just asked him to try it. So, it was and fun. that's where we were at, like, let's give it a whirl, let's see what we got. Yeah, and I haven't heard anything. <laughs> so the, the couple things that I would like to see on this is, one, I'd like to see the reimbursement. Yep. Yeah. 
calculated in so that at the end of each year you can kind of see what the cash, what it actually was costing you. Because it does present a nicer picture yeah. out at the end. The other thing, and I'm not sure how to how to say this one because um, this kind of goes along our building discussions too, is when we look at this 2018 and 2019, only four of those buses are really 2018, 2019. They were all out of that budget year. But were they? So yes. you paid them all out of yes. that year. Yeah. But six of the buses are going to Be go into this year's reimbursement right. year. Right. And when it when it comes down to here to the next group of ten, mm -hmm. are you getting any of those for a mid-year delivery, or are they all going to be summer? It'll depend. It'll, it'll depend on um, when the leases come in. Okay. So the four that we got mid-year, we're already sitting on the lot, and so we just delivered them right away. Um, okay. The six we were waiting for lease. Um, so then that throws our eleven thousand dollars off a year for those right. six buses. Right. The start of it. Right. So anyway, I'd like to see yeah. that kind of reflected. Yeah in here and then what like that assumption would be when you come to the meeting or whether we would, would well, we I want think, a mid year I think the other way that you could look at that too and I know I did that a couple of times even though we weren't going to take physical delivery for it, they got put in the previous year's books so that we could keep the reimbursement clean. I don't know if the rules have changed but I know that we did that twice in my tenure. Yeah I'll have to look I want to say that the you could you had to either do when you paid or when they were on site, we could do whatever was later until so they came to August. So I put them on this year's or this, this year's now, but I can check and see on that. Okay. Yeah. So there, I guess there is, there is a, there was a workaround for that yeah. specific issue. So if you wanted to get your, make sure you were going to have reimbursement for those mm -hmm. right away, starting in August, so you could repay or mm -hmm. make other arrangements to make sure they were on your year's books, even though you didn't physically have them. Yeah. And we did pay for that. This year, I think it's next year, about looking at something to do with a tractor. And the okay. So that was in your facility, that's in the facility place. So, my, my hope is to bring this back to November, unless you guys want to see something in October, but I, don't, I wouldn't have quotes yet. So, my hope is to get everything to you guys by November, November, December, or whatever long it needs to do. Would have it in time for the November board meeting. At least the initial new information here. So this is the, the next time you'll probably hear about it is November. That's 
Any other items for discussion? I guess the only thing related to our facilities meeting is we talked a little bit before this meeting and then we touched on it in facilities to try getting a uniform look and feel for when we're looking at building projects and things like that to try to get things listed in. And the other part that I don't know how you how to represent, and this is probably the biggest thing we're going to struggle with, is when we sit in January and approve a project that comes out of what we think is that year's budget, we're allocating for it, but because it gets paid or completed in August, it shows up in the next year's year. And have it so that it it makes sense for you and makes sense for the committees looking at it that we can kind of track a project more by when it's done than the budget year falls into so um, did you show me your draft I should talk so. show that yeah and then we'll take some feedback from that like I said when I talked to Jim Nolan he's like now's the time to do it I'm trying to figure Jim Novak's spreadsheet out so if we do something different and we bring Jim Nolan in right now he can fit right into plug his stuff in as we go so I think at, at its core when you made the last presentation I was teasing you a little bit about they're usually more precise than that. that's actually where I was going I said, you know, we can't really tell what we spent on this year's budget, what got moved from here, where it all came from. You know, no fault for you. I, no. didn't ask, I didn't ask you for that. Well, and there's times where we have roofing projects that are paid two or three years later because we're waiting for them to give us a punch card and they won't. And you know what I mean? So there's times where we just can't control what budget year, but I could, I'll look at how can we relay that to you. That's, you know, that so when we, when we do do that, if we have something like that, a big project that lays out there, from an accounting standpoint, then a big work got done. And, for like for term 2010, mm -hmm. and they get paid for it for 2013. What budget are you going to come out of? 2013, because we're cash. So as soon as it happens, that's when it gets built. Like yeah. a lot of so summer projects, we're walking and we're starting them in June. We're not built till after July 1, so it gets built into the next fiscal year. And our auditors always ask us when they come, what what capital projects did you do this year? What's not been paid? What's still outstanding? So they're accounting for you're going to you're going to have this bill coming next year. So so do you do put that money aside and carry it forward until it's paid for? Well, what we do is we just when I go to budget the next year because all the money like in 2010, if there was any leftover money that was maybe set aside for that project and didn't get used, it goes to the fund balance, and then you start with a brand new budget in 2011. So you have to kind of either know it's there and budget for it, or if it comes in and it sets you over budget, then you'll have to maybe amend your budget. So it, it's one of those kind of but you go so back in and pull it from the fund balance. You could go back. You could go back and do that to keep it clean. Just, just to jump ahead in the mindset to kind of follow up on something Tom talked about before was you put a $25,000 placeholder there for a tractor or a $25,000 placeholder there for a stadium. If we don't spend it, it just goes back to the general fund. No, it goes back to the fund balance of that fund. So if we put a $25,000 placeholder in capital projects and fund 60 and we don't spend it, it goes to the fund balance for capital projects. So it's 60. still there. It's still there, yeah. And you'll notice if you look at like our fund balances, most of them are growing. O and M is one that some of them are not. You know, we spend more, but most of them are growing with the revenue. So yeah, it just goes to that fund balance. That's, that's where my issue is. It's like with the, something like the stadium. I start thinking like Social Security in the lockbox. You say you put twenty five thousand and you put it in Social Security or in that box, but if, unless you physically separate that into a different account, it it's too easy to pull it back out and use it for something else. And that's and P, we have P, we have investments with PMA, um, and they've got you know we have different funds with them. We have our capital development funds. We have a sales tax fund. I mean, so if that was something that you wanted to do, we could talk. Up, we could. I mean, this is maybe we decide, do we want a special account for the stadium? Or for, you know what I mean, or, you know, it would still be a fund 60, it would still be capital projects, but something that is earmarked for um, and start investing and growing that. You know, there, there's some options I think that we could discuss. Because we really don't, other than these fund balances that would cover like a roof that you didn't get built in time, we really don't have any accounts that we earmark or, or set aside for something like a stadium. No. If you wanted to start that, 
that it would sit in there and grow. But there isn't really anything. It would have to there. be part of a capital project fund, and we and there's not really, like you said, there's nothing earmarked right now necessarily. Um, but the board, I, think, I believe, has some of that decision making to say we want to, just like the sales tax money, we, we, you guys decided we want this to a capital project. I mean, so there is some. And I can talk to PMA and say, what are our options? You know, what do other school districts do when they have big stuff and want to say whatever? So I can find out the next business meeting. Is there at least a discussion in the future? I think so too. Because, like you said, you place hold 25000 and then you have a sewer that breaks. You know what I mean? Like, there's right. life happens. And so if you're actually setting it. If you're in year five, we should have money to set aside for teachers. Is there any other items for discussion? One question. Being some of those items came up, would we say November 6th? Mm -hmm. Do you see a follow-up meeting back here? Do you want to wait a month? Let Melissa get some information. I didn't just like slight the set aside that that time. Because what we could do is do something similar and run back to back and be both of you guys got it right here. Or right here. Yeah. Make, rather than gobble up two nights. We can do five and six thirty again. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. Thank you everyone. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming.